Hello and welcome to On Point, I'm Sofia Vasquez. Street vendors are a huge part of the Los Angeles vibrant food scene. Every night, they gather on sidewalks to sell everything from tacos to tamales to elote, the famous Mexican street corn. For many vendors, most of their income comes from selling food out on the streets, but it's been a struggle. California legalized street vending in 2018, but vendors must follow county public health department regulations and proper permits costing $291. That's more than many can afford, and there are an estimated of 10,000 vendors here in LA County. But according to the law firm Public Council, as of last August, only 200 were able to receive the permits. They must also buy code compliant cards, which often cost more than they make. So even though street vending is no longer illegal, Public Council reported that many street vendors are more exposed to the threat of ticketing, harassment and fines, creating a cycle of criminalization and poverty. Public Council also reported that many street vendors face harassment from not just customers, but from other nearby businesses. In January, authorities say a food truck operator in Whittier got into an argument with a street vendor he thought was selling in his spot. The food truck put out the vendor's grill with a fire extinguisher, trying to force them to leave. Later, NBC4 reported sheriff's deputies arrested the food truck operator on vandalism charges. Many street vendors are demanding protection. So, is there anything the city, the county, or the state can do to ensure street vendors can continue to sell safely? On Point's Noe Ortega has more. Thank you, Sophia. And today we have our guest, Lyric Kelker, who is the Policy Director for Community Development Organization Inclusive Action for the City, and Jeanette Biafania, who is a multimedia journalist and reporter for online publication LA Taco. How are you two today? We're good. So today, first question is going to be, are street vendors good for the public to have around? Whether yes or no, please explain why. We'll start off with uh, Lyric. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just start off by saying absolutely. They, they are um, an incredible resource to our communities. They bring safety, they bring light, they bring uh, goods and services and food. Um, often, especially for food vendors, they often are in communities that don't have access to a healthy, fresh produce, and they are often that source in their neighborhoods, and they are the backbones of many of our economies, our local economies, and um, any money that is spent on a street vending business goes back into the local economy, therefore boosting economics of the neighborhood. So in short, yes, absolutely, street vendors are great for um, LA and uh, just broadly and especially for our economy and they're cultural icons and cultural gems. Yeah, they're pretty much said, <laughs> said it well. Um, yes, the answer is yes. They, you know, they serve the communities that they're in. Um, like Lyric mentioned, you know, especially like in food desert areas, you know, mm -hmm. you see these vendors selling fresh produce, affordable food, um, so yeah, they, they, they serve the communities that they're in. Um, I feel like I hear that from vendors. I hear that from advocates and I see that, you know, you see it when you're in your community, um, they're there for breakfast they're there for lunch, they're there for dinner. Um, and it's affordable. And, you know, like Lyric mentioned, it, it, it helps the economy too of the community because they're buying from the local stores. Um, and you know, they're, they're essential. I would say they're essential to, to yeah. LA and to our communities. And uh, like she mentioned, you know, they're a part of LA culture. You cannot speak about LA without mentioning street vendors. Well, another thing is, uh, so most street vendors are people who are either immigrants or you know families of immigrants. Why do you think people turn to street vending? I mean, there's many reasons. I think that everybody comes here with with a goal in mind, with a dream, and you know, a lot of them will tell you that it's out of necessity, and that's true because um, it's hard to get jobs, especially now during the pandemic, which we're still in. Um, it's very hard, and but a lot of them do, like they take pride in what they do. It's not just out of necessity, like they love doing what they do. They love cooking, they love interacting with their community. Um, but yeah, no, like they, they're they just, they, it, it's hard to get jobs out there. And and street vending is, you know, it's there. It's it's They see it when you go to LA, you know, you see them everywhere, like they see that it's working. I mean, there's issues definitely, and they need more pathways um, for them to be successful. But yeah, I think that they, they love what they do out of necessity, but they really do love what they do. 
the lyric did you have a response to the question echoing Jeanette and saying that um it you know it's considered a low barrier to entry field and position and it is incredibly entrepreneurial and showcases the hard work and dedication of folks who choose street vending as um, their career. And um, this is, as Jeanette said, there are, there's a, a lack of pathways to support them. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do in that front, but um, their incredible contributions, again, to our local economies, to our neighborhoods and um, also delicious. They, they take a lot of pride in, in their food and as they should, because it, you know, I love going to my local street vendors to get uh, good eats and I'm pretty sure everybody in LA does. So if someone wants to sell food on the street, what sort of equipment or permits does LA County want you to have? Uh, in LA County, so there, it's a little bit complicated. So for food vendors, they have to get a series of different permits that have to happen. Mm -hmm. um, typically within a jurisdiction, so like the city of Los Angeles, for example, they have a sidewalk vending permit. And so you have to get the sidewalk vending permit, but in order for you to get that permit, there's a lot of other things that, that a vendor has to get, including their seller's permit, which is a state permit, the BTRC, the business tax registration certificate, which is a local business registration. Um, in order to get your seller's permit, you need to get your I-10, your uh, uh, I forget what it stands for. You're, it's a tax ID number for folks who um, don't have a social security number and that's actually a federal requirement. And then um, on top of that for food vendors, they need to get a permit from the Department of Public Health. And that particular permit is incredibly difficult to get for a number of different reasons. And I, I would love to hear uh, Jeanette's understanding because she's written extensively about this. Yeah, the food permit, I feel like it's one of the big ones that vendors struggle with. And it's one of the many reasons um, of why they're being targeted and still being, you know, criminalized, even though street vending has been, street vending has been legalized. Um, I mean, the numbers themselves say, say this, you know, like in 2020, mm -hmm. only 165 permits were given out of like over 10,000 street vendors in LA. That alone tells you everything. Um, but the food permit in particular for vendors is extremely too nearly impossible to get. Simply put, um, the requirements asked from the health department are simply not written with street vendors in mind. Um, the requirement, for example, that they ask for, you're talking about like four sinks and 20 cubic feet of, um, of what's it called, refrigeration space microwaves, washing stations. And when you think of your local elotero or like your local vendors, mm -hmm. you, you can't really think of them um, pushing a, a huge cart, you know, down the block. It's just not yeah. realistic. Mm -hmm. um, the health department, you know, does follow the California Retail Food Code Law, which has um, implemented some of these requirements that we're talking about in California in general. Mm -hmm. um, and advocates um, and street vendors themselves, you know, have expressed how this law um, is outdated and it needs to be rewritten with vendors in mind. Um, without this law being changed, there really isn't much vendors can do. And what they are most upset about is, you know, the city and law enforcement usually gives them, you know, they're always enforce the law, but they never give solutions to how they can get this permits or how to better like the permit system. Um, mm -hmm. And street vendors lose out on so much when, the, when these things happen, like when they have uh, their stuff confiscated, thrown away. And a lot of this is because they don't have that, um, the health department permit, but it's nearly impossible to get uh, if you don't have the right cart. Yeah. That's a very interesting point because you said, I think last year on, over a hundred? Uh, health permits were given out to food vendors? 65, yeah, out of over 10,000 street vendors. Okay, because we tried to get somebody from the public uh, health department to come on the show, and they weren't able to, nobody was able to come on, but they did send me a response. And one of the, the comments, the person who was in the public health department issued that public health issues over 1,000 public health permits to mobile food vendors each year. So is there a different type of um, permit that they're talking about compared to the one that you're, uh, that you were mentioning? 
I can clarify a couple of these numbers. So the the 165 is specifically is specific to the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. LA County Department of Public Health is the full LA County. Mm -hmm. The all eight, well, it's actually only 85 of the cities within it, plus all unincorporated areas. Mm -hmm. um, and then also mobile. I don't know how, specifically how they're classifying this, but food vendors are classified the same way as food trucks called mobile mm -hmm. food facilities, and so. It could be that there's a mix of, um, I don't know for sure based on, on what they've written to you, but um, it could be that there's a mix of food trucks as well as food, street food vendors. Mm -hmm. Not to mention that um, there are certain types of food vendors that are easier to get permits for. So like prepackaged foods such as chips, paletas, um, things like that. The carts do mm -hmm. exist and they're, they're, they're um, I won't say straightforward, but they're easier to get than yeah. um, like a taquero who doesn't have any equipment that has been approved by, or like oftentimes they won't have the equipment accessible to them that's been approved by DPH. Mm -hmm. So it could be that there's been a thousand food vendors in the last, in some time period, um, mm -hmm. but it's probably the um, paletas, chips, and then maybe some fruit vendors in certain circumstances. Just wanted to make make that clear because this is what they told me, so I wasn't sure if it was if it was a different permit. <laughs> uh, how important are street vendors as a source of fresh fruit to certain neighborhoods? Extremely important. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, there's a lot of areas in LA that are considered food deserts and don't have, and the community doesn't have easy access um, to go to these stores. You know, whether it's transportation issues, money issues. Um, but these vendors are there. They're there providing fresh produce, whether it's the cup fruit or like, you know, when you see them, the big um, sacks of naranjas, yeah. whatever food it may be, you know, it's there and it's um, easy access for, for a lot of these communities. And uh, is the County of Los Angeles asking for a lot or do they need more regulations met before selling food on the streets? I'm going to jump back a little bit. So as Jeanette men mentioned, there's something called the California Retail Food Code. That's a state level code. Mm -hmm. And so the state of California has this code and each department of public health across the state is charged with enforcing that code. And so yes. LA County is required to enforce the California Retail Food Code. And then within that, LA County also has its own interpretation and they, they assume they make certain assumptions about it. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I, I'd be remiss not to mention that we do have a bill right now to amend the California Retail Food Code called SB 972. Mm -hmm. And we are very much looking forward to, to, you know, pushing that forward and making sure that it happens because it'll really right size and modernize the California Retail Food Code so that food vendor, street food vendors are not classified and required to have the same set of things that a food truck is required to have or a big hitch trailer because yeah. they typically sell, we did a, we did a, a, a survey of, of a couple thousand vendors um, back in like 2020 to 2021. And we found that typically they sell between one and two menu items. And so that's mm -hmm. very different than a food truck that has something like, you know, 20 or 30 menu items and mm -hmm. having all the equipment that's associated with it. So really this is about modernizing the code and making sure that the local department of public health, all of them across the state, are interpreting in a way that actually benefits vendors and still promotes health safety instead of just restricting them outright, which is effectively what it does right now. Because mm -hmm. the other thing that's required for a health permit is a commissary space. And we happen to know that there are not enough commissary spaces to accommodate. If every single food vendor were to get a permit right now, there would not be enough commissary spaces. Because as far as we know, there's only eight across the county that mm -hmm. can service food vendors. Um, and eight different commissaries is not going to be able to hold all of their current clientele plus 10,000 more. Yeah. Okay. So the answer is yes. I think DPH is asking for too much. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a matter of like them really, and this goes not just for the health department, but really like officials as well. Like when you're writing these laws or these requirements, you really need to have the people who it's going to impact in mind. Um, and in this case, it's vendors. And I feel like a lot of the times they hide behind this like health um, um, 
like maybe they're they're not clean or this and that but if you've ever visited um a street vendor stand whether it's tacos elotes um pupusas whatever it may be you know like they're clean they have their cleanup crews at the end of the day mm -hmm. um, and it's just a matter of them working with them and really talking to them and, and talking to the, the vendors in the community to hear like what works for them what doesn't and kind of having a meeting in the middle and having mm -hmm. middle ground i would say um one thing i want to ask as well is do you think the covid19 pandemic has affected street vendors financially and um and with the public health as well? It definitely has. Um, I mean, during the pandemic, there was still sweeps going on. Uh, there was still sweeps that were going on. There was a moratorium put in place um, for a moment, but they were there were still vendors that were getting their, their things confiscated. And they're, they're losing that on a lot. It depends on like what vendor it is. For example, I, I had a chance to interview a taquera who had her her whole equipment taken away and she lost out on over a thousand dollars of um, merchandise and equipment mm -hmm. and she hadn't even finished paying off the equipment she bought um, mm -hmm. so yes yeah, that that um, that pandemic before during and after uh, well hopefully not after but right now you know these confiscations these uh, citations these encounters mm -hmm. with the health department sometimes law enforcement um, they, you know, they don't not only traumatize them <laughs> sometimes, but it also yeah. it, it, like they accumulate debt because they're having mm -hmm. their things thrown away or their things um, taken away. So definitely huge, huge. They've been impacted enormously by the pandemic. I'll just add that. So as I mentioned, we did the survey and 96% um, of vendors saw a drop in sales based on just that survey. Mm -hmm. And um, we surveyed around 3000 vendors. So that's a, a pretty good chunk of folks who saw a severe drop in sales. And um, we know, so Inclusive Action as an organization also serves, um, has street vendors as our clients. And uh, we know that a lot of folks have not been able to make it back up to their pre-COVID sales. Um, and have are some of the most entrepreneurial people that I know and they pivot and um, have made sure that they're selling goods or foods that uh, their constituents need on, you know, a moment's notice, they're able to, to do it that way. And I just, you know, commend them for the incredible hard work that they've, they've done for the last two years of the pandemic. And of course, previous to that and will continue to do. Okay. So right now we're gonna, we're gonna see a video on a street vendor that we were able to speak to. The city passes, but we aren't afraid. We keep going forward because this is our job and we have to keep going. So seeing like you said, um, I think Jeanette, you said it, that one of, your, one of your friends had their stuff, their car or food confiscated. Um, how aggressive are police in enforcing these laws? I do want to say there is vendors who have maybe had good interactions with police, but for the majority of the part, I feel confident in saying that, you know, law enforcement and their interactions with vendors often, not always, but often are not pleasant. Um, they can be very aggressive, as we've seen in a lot of videos that go viral. Um, often these officers work along with the health department and accompany the health department to, with, to these sweeps that we see um, happen across the city. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely, and you know, we can say this, I mean, we see it, we saw it recently in Santa Monica, mm -hmm. and I feel like we see it every now and then, every month, at least once or more than once a mm -hmm. month, we see or hear about these raids and law enforcement is usually always um, present for this. And you know, that, that them being present can be very intimidating for vendors, but like the vendor in the video that you showed, Mm -hmm. you know, they're very resilient like they know that that they're out there working they're not doing anything bad a lot of them will say the same thing um saying you know like we're just trying to make a living like they're not selling drugs mm -hmm. they're not doing anything bad they're just sharing their food their culture um with everybody else yeah Did, is there anything you want to add lyric um yeah, the majority of the stories that I've heard and seen have all been um, not great interactions with law enforcement. And um, we know that, you know, 
armed enforcement doesn't go enforce for brick and mortar businesses. So why are they doing this to street vendors, a predominantly immigrant population? Um, it mm. is very intimidating and unnecessary when, as Jeanette said, they're, they're just doing their day's work. It's not, they're just trying to sell food and sell goods to make, make ends meet and uh, make their community thrive. And there, there's been reports of a street vending cart that is in the early stages. Have you, have any of you heard about it? Is it um, the tamal cart? Yes. So that one is already approved, um, which is great, but it's also an example of how long it takes um, to, for the health department to work with, in this case, you know, Richard, the engineer, um, mm -hmm. and that. Um, it is approved, but it took them several years of back and forth with the health department, yeah. and speaking with tamal vendors and everything um, to make this a reality. So, you know, it's a great example of like what we can do moving forward or what the health department can do moving forward. Mm -hmm. But it also, I think it's important for people to understand that that took a while. These men, you know, are, are incredible. They know this, the system and all, but could you imagine like a vendor who doesn't trying to build yeah. their own cart mm -hmm. uh, for the health department to ultimately say no? Um, it's, it's hard. Um, but yes, the, the cart has been approved. A few vendors have already uh, gotten their permits for the carts, which is amazing. Um, but, you know, it's a step forward, but there's mm -hmm. still a long way to go. No, will, will the cart cost less or will it make it easier for uh, vendors to are able to sell on the street? They are selling them, but right now they are doing a lot of donations. They've given out um, five carts with LA Talk, six. No, five carts with LA Taco, sorry. Mm. Um, and I do think that they're planning on doing more giveaways. The cart itself, I believe when we first talked about the design, they mentioned somewhere along 7,000 to 7,500, um, which is still pretty pricey for vendors, but it's cheaper than some of the other carts that are out there that mm -hmm. could run up to like $12,000. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, I know Richard mentioned, you know, wanting to like offer like payments or loans they do have a GoFundMe for people to donate so they can use that money to give more carts. Um, so they're really trying to make an effort to get as many vendors this carrito that, mm -hmm. that, that is essential for, for, for everybody. But this one is specifically for tamal vendors only. And I just want to put a quick pin in that, that mm -hmm. it took years for this one very specific food. Yeah. So the reason that it's a tamal vendor specifically is because of one sentence in the California Retail Food Code that calls out three foods, one of them being tamales. So it's um, incredibly, like this document is incredibly technical and really wild that food vendors are expected to um, know it, you know, backwards and forwards to be, a, to be able to develop their own cart. What are the other two foods on that on that list? Hot dogs and corn on the cob. Oh, elotes. Okay. They don't. It doesn't say elotes. <laughs> it says corn on the cob. Yeah. Is it fair, in your opinion, that there are unpermitted street vendors who are making money by selling food on the same block as a vendor who pays to have a permit or a food truck operator, for example? I think it's comparing apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. So there's um, first there's a myth that there's competition between different types of businesses on the same block, which mm -hmm. is not true. There's been lots of studies that showcase that street vending actually promotes pedestrian activity and brings more customers to different businesses. Mm -hmm. And then comparing a permitted food truck to an unpermitted street vendor is, um, that's difficult for many different types of reasons, everything from access to capital, a food truck costs a lot more. So there's like a class differentiation between the two. Mm -hmm. And then for street vending, there really isn't a, a true pathway forward as Jeanette was men mentioning earlier in order for them to get a food truck or sorry, excuse me, a permit for their food, um, their food vending, sidewalk vending business. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know, Jeanette, how, how you'd think about it. Yeah, same. I think a lot of food, not all of them, but some food truck um, owners started out as vendors. And a lot of vendors mm -hmm. 
um, have dreams, you know, some of them are okay with being a vendor and want to, that's why they want to push for like these permits to be more accessible. But also a lot of them have dreams of owning a food truck <clears throat> or even a brick and mortar restaurant, which many have done, but it's a lot of hard work. It's, um, it, you know, it's, it's different. I think Lyric put it well when she said, you know, that comparing the two is just, there's too many things that are different um, mm -hmm. um, as far as like getting their permits, um, money. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't compare the two. And I feel like a lot of the times food trucks, at least some that I've had interactions with, you know, there's a community of vendors. They talk to each other. Um, hey, I'm going to set up here. You know, they, they tell that to, to the food truck owners. And a lot of the time they don't have um, a problem with it because at the end of the day, you know, the street isn't owned by mm -hmm. any food truck um, or business. Um, so, but they do have those dialogues between sometimes between brick and mortar businesses and food truck owners. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's just trying to make a living. That's what I would say. Well, it looks like that's all the time that we have. I want to thank you two for coming on the show. I love hearing what you guys said and thank you again. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. You're watching On Point and we'll be right back. When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move. So I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. I never graduated from high school. I realized I wanted to go back to school because I didn't want to work these backbreaking jobs the rest of my life. With the help of my father and having my son, that was all the motivation that I needed to come back to school. I felt accomplished. It made me feel that I could take on whatever challenges life throws at you. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. I'm heading out, man. You want to ride? No, I got my car, but I actually really need to go to the bathroom. Dude, are you okay? I am definitely buzzed. Yeah. I think I will take this, and I will take that ride home. Well, that's it for On Point. You can follow us on social media, Seesaw On Point. You can hear us at KCSN 88.5 FM, where we have Sunday mornings at 5.30. You can also watch us at the LA 36 and Santa Clarita Valley Television. For all of us here at On Point, I'm Sofia Vasquez. Mm -mm. This is good. This is really good.